Talo for lover and welcome to Talo no Sa'o. Uh, my name is Liao Tulsley. Welcome to Welcome to Talo no Sa'o. My name is Eli Tihile. We have a very special guest tonight, which I'm going to ask him to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Ethan Aloiai. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. This is on Apna 36. This is on Freeview. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to start with the way that we always do, with a bit of lotu. So we'll just jump straight in. All right. Dear Lord. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the gift of life itself. Thank you for giving breath in our bodies. Thank you for the truth that it is always something that you have there, even when people try to hide it. So, Lord, we pray that you are in this discussion, that you're in this talanoa, that we discuss it strong and subtle, uh, and we have a great time always. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Wow, Elliot. Awesome. So, um, Tell us about what happened last night. Oh, right. At um, Pacific Wave. Pacific Wave, right, yeah, right, yeah. right. So uh, what was a great thing that we did was uh, we had the Pacific Wave event. Uh, Fui Awai was, of course, he is our, our sneaky uh, blue wave guy. He's our Pacific <laughs> Wave the guy there. And uh, it was family first led. Bob McCoskey was talking about all of the dangerous things that have been done to your children, that the freedoms that have been taken away from our people and our children and also the idea of Christianity uh, being directly assaulted by the laws that are coming out currently. Yeah. And I think it was really good. We had a, a lot of the Faifiao, and we had a, the very, we had Tongans, Cook Islanders, we had Nui, uh, we had Tuvalu, we had, we had quite a few different uh, groups represented there. Full house, pretty much. Uh, oh, we had food. We had good food. <laughs> uh, but it was a really good uh, discussions that we had there. So uh, I had to actually leave after about an hour. Uh, I, I sort of double booked, <laughs> uh, so I had to sort of run away. But what I saw there anyway was powerful. Uh, Irony Clark opened up, and then you had Nick Tutasi and Afrangaro and Bob McCoskey and, and the other guys there. But mm. big, powerful people, uh, those who lead our community in uh, spiritual matters. So, yeah, can't wait to see what happens uh, for West Auckland and what happens in the future. So you enjoyed it? I loved powerful. it. Absolutely loved it. Did you? Did you? Like leave feeling a little convicted, or did you feel yes, I'm on the right path? This is exactly what we've been talking about here. And I think that I think I respect those who are within the bounds of Asamoa, the traditions and values of the the traditional ways. I am what I would refer to as a hybrid or afakasi, or you know, hybrid. those where we have we have followed the values of Pacifica, general Pacifica culture. Uh, but we've also grown up in Nusila style. Yeah. So I'm a bit more out there in terms of believing that, no, if you if you believe in life, fight for life. If you believe in freedom, fight for freedom. Speak it out. Be be bold and and risk offending others if that is what is required. Yeah. And I, so I respect those who are sort of, I wouldn't say trapped, but I would say restricted within the restricted. traditional way. Yeah. Uh, however, last night I think I saw that more and more of those who were even within that were more ready to step up in a more public fashion mm. to defend the values that Pacifica are well known for and even to look at the mottos of Tonga and Samoa, especially when we regard those those real biblical truths that are involved in that. Mm. You know, when you come to the point where you have no choice, mm. you know, you need to stand in that place and whether we're Tongan or Samoan, you know, we've had these values instilled in us mm. since, you know, before we were born to come to this point. And, you know, this is a great way to bring Ethan into the story mm. because he's had to do the same thing. And you've had to stand in a very difficult place and be able to not only um, talk about your faith and how it's grounded you, but also have to deal with being cancelled. Mm. Attempted cancel. Yeah. Yeah. They failed yeah. against me, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. Can I just spend a moment? Look, yeah. the, Ethan is here now. I'm sure that many of you already recognise Ethan a little bit. Uh, and this is actually the man who who <laughs> cut through so much of the noise last year. Was it last year? Last yeah. year. It was last year. He, he basically, the, the media, nationwide, the media just tr got triggered to the baddest when Ethan did what he did. Uh, you had nationwide triggering, you had hundreds of people walking past him just 
going out of their minds. Some of you have even seen that viral video that went across the board. Uh, this is a brave young man who is, uh, he's teaching in South Auckland to our South Auckland kids. He stood up and man, the, the mainstream media just went crazy. Uh, and that's why it's so exciting to have Ethan here with us today. So, uh, yeah, I'd love for Ethan to maybe say, why is it that you sort of set them off in <laughs> yeah. the blaze? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege to be here to chat with you guys. Uh, so, like you've mentioned, I'm a Christian. I work at a Christian school in Manurewa. I teach students in South Auckland. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is seeing the Lordship of Christ go out into the earth. Mm. And before Jesus left, one of the last things he said to his disciples was, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Mm. There, therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And one of the things that directly violates the commands of Christ is injustice. Yeah. As a Christian, I, I, I cannot stand in the face of injustice and say nothing. Mm. I'm compelled by my Lord to speak up when I see injustice. Yeah. And last year, uh, when the Black Lives Matter movement really got rolling, one of the things they were advocating was no justice, no peace. Yes, right. Uh, yeah. That was the main chant I heard when I was at the Black Lives Matter rally here in Auckland City. But one of the things that upsets me about the BLM movement is that they are not an organization that is passionate about justice. Mm. They're passionate about social justice, which is a radically different beast. Uh, for years, few years now, I, I've been carefully reading the literature of social justice in academia. It's called critical theory and critical race theory. And um, I've been trying to keep up with their perspective. And one of the things I've realized is that what they're advocating, although they use the name social justice, it's actually an ideology that perpetuates destruction. It's the Black Lives Matter movement is an organization that if they get their way, if they have their principles enacted in the world, their principles would cause immeasurable suffering to black and brown people. So we've heard about these you know, powerful statements from you know, the, the leftist style politicians about social justice. Mm. They're saying that, nah, social justice is what's needed to create equity and uh, that, that there's uh, an oppressed people out there who are generally our people are oppressed. And so social justice, and justice, they are trying to say is the same. Is it the same? Absolutely. What, what's, the, what's the roughly difference? Yeah, absolutely not. They're, they're worlds mm. apart. And I think the main place you see the difference, you mentioned the word equity. And for the social justicians of the world, uh, lots of their thinking comes from the world of critical theory. And in, in the realm of critical theory, their starting point is a couple of basic assumptions about the world that aren't reflective of reality. One of their assumptions is that Society is made up of systems of power and oppression. So society is constructed yeah. of groups that oppress other groups, and that's how we should examine society. They also have another uh, foundational assumption. So that first assumption comes to us um, through Marxism and neo-Marxism mm. and the Frankfurt School and um, Antonio Gramsci and his ideas of hegemony. The other assumption comes from postmodernism, and this is the idea that knowledge itself is socially constructed mm. and f therefore when you start with those presuppositions those assumptions one of the things that happens is the way you identify injustice in the world is you look for a disparity in outcomes and you are, you you find a disparity in outcomes and then you assign that disparity to some sort of oppression taking place so oh. you see for, for example um, pi and Maori kids don't do as well in school as white kids from the social justice worldview, you look at that disparity and you take your foundational assumptions, your way of examining the world, and you go, that's because the white system has its hegemonic structure of how knowledge is constructed that benefits white kids and, not the brown and kids. oppresses yeah. white kids. Mm. Yeah. Therefore, the only way to have justice is to have equal outcomes in all areas. Mm. So that's the so foundational equal difference. outcomes, not equal opportunities, but that they, they all the kids come out the same. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And because they have this idea that knowledge is socially constructed, it's one of the things that frustrates you. You probably see it in politics. One of the moves that politicians have tried to make is conflating 
equality of opportunity with equality of outcomes. Mm. And they use the language of equality of opportunity when they're literally talking about having equal outcomes. So what's, I mean, what's the difference? Well, I mean, equality of opportunity, equality of outcome, what's the difference? So the, the massive problem with wanting equality of outcomes is, um, as, as Thomas Sowell cites in his book, it's never been seen in history. You don't mm. have societies producing equal outcomes because different people different have things. different values yeah. and different priorities. Mm. And because of those different priorities, they make different decisions and those different decisions naturally have different outcomes. So if you want equal outcomes, you need to suppress that fundamental reality of human nature, human nature. which means if you want equal outcomes, you need to restrict freedoms. So if you want equal outcomes, you can have that, but you need to embrace tyranny for it. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when that is tried, the only time you get close to equal outcomes is when everyone is equally dirt poor. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what's happened throughout history is these doctrines have been tried in societies. So where, where have they been tried? So if you're saying mm -hmm. that uh, in order for an equality of outcomes to occur, you must, you must basically take away free will, stop the ability of people being able to, to make decisions for themselves. Do we have, you're saying that there are examples, mm. where are these examples? What sort of societies or what countries have done these things yeah. before? So in the last century, it's actually an experiment a number of countries have tried to run. And one of the things you see is, because it's an experiment that's been tried, it's been tried in different cultures with different histories and different backgrounds, different people groups and different parts of the world. So it's a, an experiment that's had lots of iterations mm. and the results been the same every time. So Russia, for example, they tried this um, after the Russian Revolution right. under Lenin and Stalin. 20 million Russians died mm. during that time. Mm. It was tried again by Mao Zedong in China. Um, the Great Leap Forward led to 60 million Chinese dead. Mm. Now, some people might be finicky of those numbers. Tens of tens of tens of millions of people died when this experiment has been tried. Um, Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge. Right. Um, more recent example, Venezuela. Mm. The yes. most wealthiest nation in South America plummeted into poverty to the point where they were having a, an issue. Too many people were dying of starvation, but they, they had a solution. They made it illegal for doctors to put starvation as cause of death on death certificates. Oh, so they wow. fixed that problem wow. at least. Yeah. Oh, wow. But this is an experiment that's been tried mm. and everywhere it's been tried, this ideology has wreaked havoc across the globe. Mm. This ideology is one of the most murderous, hateful ideologies that someone can embrace. And when I see people wanting to inflict that ideology on black and brown people, because I love justice, true biblical justice, mm. I say that is evil and you're trying to do injustice to people that look like my family members, people that look like my friends. Mm. This is not okay. Your ideology is evil and I want to resist it. Um, so because of those reasons, when I heard that there was going to be a BLM protest in Auckland City, this was already after um, billions of dollars of damages had been done in the States people's livelihoods had been burned to the ground. Good men had been killed, like mm, David Dorn, right. a retired yeah, police right. officer. Yep. Um, the, the, it was already clear that BLM was a destructive and evil organization. Mm. So I wanted to go and protest their protest and have conversations with people about the fact that the BLM organization does not care about black people. Their ideology does not care about the thousands of black people murdered in gang violence every year. Um, and they don't care about the innocent black babies being murdered every year in abortion. Yep. States yep. like New York, more black babies are uh, aborted than born into the world. You will see. Wow. And that, wow. that horrifies me. And it horrifies me that those ideas are ideas that want to be pushed by the BLM organization. Mm. Um, so when they say black lives matter, I don't believe them. Not one bit do I believe them when they stay silent. No one knows the names of the black children who are shot in drive-by shootings when they're in the drive through with their parents. Mm. Um, and no one knows the names of the innocent babies who go to medical waste bins and are disposed of. Um, 
I have a three-month-old baby. Me and my wife just had a baby. And, oh, congratulations. And, and when I see him, <clears throat> babies just like him are, are discarded and treated as worthless. Their lives don't matter to the, the BLM organization. So th they don't care about justice. Yep. They, their ideas are, are killing hundreds of thousands of innocent black babies every single year. Mm. So I wanted to go to this protest and have conversations with people about the fact that this organization that they're supporting doesn't care about justice. Mm. Um, so I wanted to go there, have those conversations. I, I have a, a deep dislike of the BLM organization and the ideology of BLM. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought a good way to generate conversation would be to wear a Make America Great Again hat. Ooh. So that was... Oh, wow. What caused quite the stir, um, but I thought if I just went there as myself, it'd be very difficult to, you know, yeah. get engagement with people. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to be seen as a part of the yeah. the yeah. protest. Yeah. That's um, a good way of uh, so uh, I set myself to out a little bit. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah. You might be somewhat differently aligned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was the goal, and I went there with the BLM hat on, and um, I'll admit, you mean the mega hat? Yeah. Sorry, the mega hat. No, no, not a BLM hat. Mega hat. Um, so I'll admit, I underestimated how fiery people were going to be because of that hat. I, I mean, I think common sense dictates it's, it's not a racist slogan. No. Mm. Um, there's many great things about America. Yep. Um, they were founded on Christian principles yep. by yep. the Puritans. I, I love that part of the history. Yep. Um, the argument is, oh, when was America great for black people? They had slavery and Jim Crow. I know th those things were terrible. Um, and I don't think anyone suggests, no one, and no one uh, on the right or the, or the conservative, yeah. no conservative ever says that, oh, yeah, yeah, sweet ass, that was awesome. Yeah, and when, when Donald Trump made that his slogan, uh, the social justice warriors want to say, oh, he wants to go back to slavery. He clearly didn't mean that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he meant um, what I love about America, the Puritan foundation and Christian influence. I think he meant we just had eight years of a Democrat, mm -hmm. And now let's have a Republican and make America great. I think it was as simple as that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I underestimated how fiery people were going to get. <laughs> so I got sworn at, pushed around. My hat got stolen and it got burnt. Did you ever get your hat back? No, I didn't. It got, it got burnt. To oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so it got burnt. And then um, I got out of there, made a video talking about some of these things. And then... then it all blew up. It just went crazy. Mm. Um, and one of the things I, I'm, I'm grateful for is the estimates, I think, said there were 5,000 people at the protest, which is a significant number. Um, and I made a video talking about the injustice of BLM and their radical nature. And that video um, got about 150,000 views, which means that wow. my yeah. attendance, my voice yeah. was heard by more people then were at attendance in, at that rally, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. And as a result of that, I think lots of people have been awakened to the reality of the wickedness of BLM. Mm. And as the year progressed, last year, the BLM movement went off its rocker. And I think a lot of the people who attended the Auckland protest on June 1st, I think by the end of the year, they had a lot of pie on their face Oy, because a lot of orcs yeah. there yeah it would have been I, I, awkward at that point i noticed even some of the sports teams who were taking a knee sort of they know they quietly sort of yeah. retreat back you know I, I noticed that that uh, that's gone on a little bit yeah yeah quite a few of the mothers have actually now come out and they're basically yeah, they stating can. that blm is is disgusting and they they just exploit mm. them and yeah, they use them yeah. which which come on we all knew that they were mm. they were going to be as well mm -hmm. uh, all right now the left are very well known for actually being quite venomous. Yeah. Was there anything that happened afterwards that might be in that vein? Now, now I also want to say, that don't talk about things if, you, if you're not allowed to talk about things for whatever reason. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah you can understand. Sure. So, yeah, like you say, um, people were very, very upset with my attendance there. And for many people, I was um, the most evil person in the country. Uh, there were some really funny like posts and stuff. Like I laughed at a lot of it. One guy tweeted, uh, good morning everyone except for Ethan Aloi. I thought that was funny. <laughs> um, <That's hilarious. laughs> like within the next couple of days. Oh, nice. um, but the, the not so funny side was on, on the video, I got, I estimate probably close to a hundred death threats. Mm. Um, 
Wow. And that's death threats, not to mention like just the normal profanity yeah, and yeah, vulgarity yeah. that people yeah. were pouring out towards me. People threatening to rape my wife. Yes, yeah, I and, saw those yeah. ones. Um, I saw, so yeah, that's you know, those are people on that left who are threatening to rape the wife. Mm. All right, that filthy, disgusting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and then one day when I was at school, I th two or three days after, probably the second day after, um, our school had to go into a lockdown because someone called the school and said that they were coming to the school to kill me. Mm. Um, so that happened. Um, uh, probably close to a dozen articles were written by all the major media yes. sites. Yes, really. Um, yeah, yep, yep. New Zealand you, you Herald, triggered them, Star, you triggered them TV, yeah. and everyone was writing articles. Um, and the venom from the left was astonishing. Mm. Mm. And I think there's a massive... Um, irony in the way that they were approaching me because when I was at the protest I saw many people wearing gang patches on their back mm. mongrel mob black power those sorts of gang patches and one of the criticisms was that my hat was a symbol of hatred um, and these courageous courageous people with their 5,000 friends were standing up to me because of my symbol of hatred mm. Um, mm. the thought that I had was there were people there with patches on their back that are a literal symbol of rape and drug distribution and yep. violence. Yep. And, and Nazism. And Nazism. And, and you, you, yep. think, you think about the CKL, yeah. Yeah, and not one of those gang members was confronted. I didn't mm. ask them all, but I can guarantee you, from what I know about these people, no one went up to one of these mongrel mob members and said, don't come here with that symbol of hatred on your back. Mm. Um, but that is literally a symbol of hatred that has wreaked havoc in brown communities in New Zealand. Mm. Yeah. That is a symbol that I detest. Um, but it takes more courage to tell a gang member that you don't like his patch. Mm. It, it doesn't take much courage to tell a Christian teacher you don't like his hat Easy. when you're surrounded by <laughs> yeah. 5,000 yeah. yeah, yeah. friends. So yeah, yeah. Th that side of things... I thought was ironic and all these people who would say things online and make threats, nothing physically happened to me yeah. and it is because um, these people are cowardly. Yes. It's, it's very easy to say things online, which is why I wasn't worried by, I knew that they were cowardly. So that happened. Um, people made complaints to the teaching council uh, to have me um, deregistered as a teacher in New Zealand. And a formal investigation had to happen. Wow. Um, and that was full on. And so they, they went after your very job. They went after your livelihood. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the three main complaints that were taken up by the teaching council, two of them were by people in the public, and one of them was by a guy named David Farrier. Um, so they took up those complaints and investigated me. And the investigation only concluded the, the event, June 1st. The investigation concluded... Um, after I'd gone on school holidays at the end of the year. Nearly six months wow. worth of investigation of them contacting my school, uh, mm. contacting me. I had to go to a trial hearing with the Complaints Assessment Committee. Wow. Um, and as I was able to present my case and things, th they were very, very sloppy in the way they handled things. Um, the complaints made against me mm. had nothing to do with the teaching code and standards, mm. which is the standard by which I was judged. So it was, it was all a, a real mess. And eventually they, they had absolutely no grounds, I'd say, on which to even begin an investigation, mm. let alone call me in for a trial. Mm. But that all happened. And then, of course, once I was able to show them all the flaws in the, the case against me, they said, oh, we're not going to pursue any more charges, mm. which is the right decision. I asked for a formal apology, but got none. Mm. Um, but that's where things got to. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. the, the, so the, the hardened leftists definitely came after you very venomously. Uh, so David Farrier was one of them. Yes. Uh, David Farrier is the person who, he actually made a fetish-based uh, documentary based off tickling, and it went into some bit of a some sexual type of a uh, little bit dodgy sort of stuff uh, around the tickling aspect uh, very uncomfortable mm, he also came after us as well just recently uh, yeah so he seems to have some very edged fringe type thoughts going on there which is unfortunate and look he's he's gone after a strong young Samoan teacher teaching our children 
the values of life, and he's gone after his very livelihood. When he's had a young child and a young family, he's trying to get there. This is what they do. This is the idea of the progressivism that we see now. Progressivists are generally regressive. That's this how they seem to operate uh, a lot of. So, mm-hmm. so where where are you right now? What's what's the status? You so everything's good. Um, they there was no continuation of investigation. It didn't go to disciplinary tribunal or anything. And my life carries on just as it always has. Nice. Um, so I continue teaching now. Um, oh, awesome. However, I'm very concerned with some of the more recent developments that have happened in education, right. uh, particularly a resource that has been released in the last month by the Teaching Council called Unteach Racism. Unteach Racism. Unteach Racism. Right. Okay. So this is a, a, a website, there's an app, there's a number of academic articles linked and newspaper articles linked and um, foundation documents in terms of their literature scan and things. And this resource is supposedly meant to equip teachers with the tools they need to dismantle racism in schools in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I'm so concerned about this document is because it embraces um, wholeheartedly the social justice idea of racism, Mm -hmm. which is entirely different. Uh, to the ordinary definition of racism right. that we mm-hmm. might have. If, if you were to ask me what is racism, um, racism is an attitude of ethnic superiority mm. or ethnic hatred, or sometimes we call the sin of partiality, treating people in an unjust way that's different. Um, the sin of, that's, that's normally what we'd call racism. You mean, you mean like BLM? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like BLM. <laughs> but this new document, this new resource released, uh, promotes the idea that the way we um, be anti-racist, mm. and this is no exaggeration, the way we be anti-racist is by discriminating against children based on their race. Wow. They quote, uh, they reference Ibram Kendi, massive New York Times bestselling author, critical theorist. They reference him in their list of uh, words that they give definitions. The word racism, they use almost verbatim his definition of racism mm-hmm. uh, from his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And in his book, he literally says, this is almost a quote, I won't say it perfectly because I read the book last year, but he says, the only way to remedy racist discrimination is with anti-racist discrimination. The only way to remedy past discrimination is with present discrimination. The only way to remedy future discrimination is with future anti-racist discrimination. So you mean beat racism by being racist? Yes, they would say, uh, even Kendi wouldn't say this, but critical theorists would say that black people can't be racist. Racism oh, wow. requires an oppressor status. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, the resource is literally promoting the idea. Uh, there's a module on the app called Unteach, equal treatment as equality. We need to unteach the idea of equal treatment being equality. Unteach equality. Unteach equal treatment as equality. So, so Martin Luther King's quote about uh, treat people by the uh, mm-hmm. content of their character, not the color of their skin, that's, that's no deal. Opposite. No that's... deal, the exact opposite. Yeah. We need to treat people differently based on the color of their skin. There's, there's this idea that uh, people have promoted of, um, people that I think are trying to treat people fairly where they say, oh, I, I'm colorblind, I just treat everyone the same. There's another module, unteach colorblindness. We need to see people's color yep. and we need to treat them differently based on their color. Wow. wow. And this is okay. called unteach racism. And this is the problem. They promote ideas like justice. They, they say they're promoting justice, but they're promoting radical injustice. Mm. They say they're promoting anti-racism, but they're promoting radical race-based discrimination. Mm. And the, the, the troubling thing with this unteach racism resource is the teaching council for each module, they've linked it to the code and standards. And they're, they're, they say, this, oh, this yeah. module is picking up on this part of the code and standards that you teachers have to sign every year and pay us $150 for. So you're saying that the code, which sort of is what the, 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 the values of the teachers overall? Yeah, mm. the, the values that the teachers have to sign each year promising to uphold. 
Is that like the teacher's code of conduct? The teacher's code of conduct, yeah, that's so exactly you, what it is. You are saying that that's going to be linked to it. So in order for you to continue teaching, you will need to adhere to yeah. that unteach. So racism. previously, there was enough ambiguity in the code and standards where someone like myself could sign and go, yeah, I'll uphold social justice by being anti-abortion and by being anti-BLM. That's my way of upholding social justice. But now they've said, no, no, social justice means our anti-racist equity doctrines. And what I think this, this will do is it will force conservative teachers out of the profession. I think if this resource was released more than a year ago, they would have been able to make a very good case that I lose my registration. But because mm. it wasn't out more than a year ago, the, the links between yeah. unteach racism and the code hadn't yet been solidified. But now they have been. And that's very concerning. How are teachers like myself, mm. who fundamentally oppose the foundations of unteach racism, how are we meant to sign the code and standards in good conduct? And how, are, how is the New Zealand education um, system being um, non-political? Mm. This is radical leftist political doctrine, mm. and our, our government institutions are meant to be non-political, but they're promoting radical political doctrine. So I don't know um, how conservative teachers can in good conscience sign this document now and remain in the profession. So I haven't yet thought through what, what, what do people what do like me like? do? Mm. Yeah. And do I just, am I not allowed to teach now because of my views? This, will, this might be a hard question. Mm. All right. I'm, a, I'm a parent. I have uh, been looking into what's been going on in the school of my children. Uh, so I'm keeping an eye on things there. Can we stop this? How do we stop this? How, mm. What can we do? Yeah, so I think one of the things that um, parents don't realise, and this is a common, common tactic used by the left, um, Parents don't realize what's in these documents. Mm. They don't realize that unteach racism is about teaching discrimination. Mm. And, and one, one author, he, he, he references um, the Mott and Bailey um, fallacy. The idea of the Mott and Bailey fallacy is that there's a, a castle on a hill that's well fortified and a lower castle that's not well fortified. And the Mott and Bailey fallacy is um, leftists, they'll have their Bailey, which is their radical... Um, like society transforming idea. Mm. And when you push them on that, they retreat to their Mott position. So for example, with the education thing, we want to radically transform education and we think knowledge is a Western construct of oppression. And you push back against that, they retreat to, oh, we just want education to be more fair for minorities. Mm. And, yeah. and they, they, they forward that argument. When people push back, they go, oh, we just want education to be better for minorities. Um, and then as soon as people back off, they, they go back to their Bailey, their radical position. So I think one of the things parents need to do is understand what's in these documents. And they need to contact their schools and say, um, I'm insisting that you do not teach my kids this material. And, I, and in fact, I think you should make a complaint to the teaching council that they're promoting this. Mm -hmm. I think conservative teachers need to rally together and say, this is not okay. Mm. I think if every conservative teacher in the country came together and said, um, we can't sign the code because of this, either take it out or find new schools for the 30,000 students who are going to be without a teacher next year. Mm. I think that would be excellent. Yeah. Um, a awesome. colleague and myself, we, we just started a Facebook page called Concerned Teachers mm. that we want to encourage people to join just so we can have a place of contact for concerned teachers to go, hey, what can we do in order to push back against mm. some of this? What's the name of that? Uh, yeah, what's the name of that? Uh, concerned, concerned teachers. teachers. Yeah. Uh, we'll get a link. We'll get a link. We'll get I was awesome. thinking we could have one called Concerned Parents. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we want parents yeah. to join yeah. as well. Okay, and okay, yeah. That way we can put information there sure. showing how these documents, these resources are going to, train their kids mm. to be racial discriminators. And I don't think parents want that. To be divisive. <laughs> to be yeah. divisive, yeah. To be able to, like, you know, it'll be a division on every front. 
You know, mm. that's what our kids will be growing up to, mm. you know, constantly divide on because you are, are brown and because you are even female, male, gender, mm. everything is going to be part of that, yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. And in this anti-teach racism document, one of the ideas that comes from critical theory is this idea that the way we've constructed knowledge is a, a, a Western frame of reference that's yeah, actually that oppression. So the idea is literally, we believe in objective truth. We believe in math and science mm. and, and reason. They would literally say that these things are just ways that have been legitimized by the white society in order to further white oppression mm. of indigenous people. Therefore, they want us to embrace other forms of knowledge as equally legitimate. Things like Maori spirituality and lived experience as on par and equally legitimate with things like math and reason and science. Mm. And again, w would this be good for, for Māori or for PI if we abandon the, the ways that we actually come to know about the world? Mm. If we abandon reason and logic and validity and sounds, would it actually be good for their education if we abandon those and instead have them doing more kapahaka and cultural studies and these sorts of things. Mm, yeah, 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 I don't think so. Yep, I, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, okay. Wow. <laughs> there was a lot to I take we, in. I think we could, be, well, we could probably talk about that one for hours, could. actually. Yeah, sorry, I, fact, I was going on a bit. No, yeah, no, yeah. no, it was good. No, no, that was, that was beautiful. Yeah. And in fact, I think we'll need to have Ethan back on, on our show. And for education, like around the education. Yeah, I think we'll need to, to have him back on. Oh, there's definitely lots listen. more to talk about. Yeah, yeah, So you, you, you're, talking about, you're talking about a mm. teacher, a Pacifica teacher who knows what's going on in the education system happening to your children. Yeah. Uh, he's spoken about that teach racism. I know that he's got a video out there. We're going to link a few different links onto our page for you to have a look at. We're going to deep dive into this as we can yeah. to bring it to you. We'll also make sure that that Facebook page is out there. If you are a teacher, uh, come and have a uh, ask us, and we'll get you guys in touch. Yeah. If you're a parent, come and ask us, and we'll get you guys in touch. Uh, but I, I think Ooh, that was that was incredible. I I hadn't even heard of that. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. It's so it's good. been really nice to have an opportunity to let more people know about this. Yeah, no so worries. Thank you so much. No, we'll, um, we'll definitely have you on again. Very very important. Uh, now uh, we uh, we have gone a little bit over time, yep. but that's not a problem. Uh, and we would love to finish off in the way that we do with a bit of lotu. So we would love for you to actually finish us off with a bit of prayer. If that's oh, I'd okay. love to. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for this conversation. We thank you that we could talk about extremely important issues, issues that are close to your heart, issues like justice and education. Uh, we pray that the authority of Christ would be recognized in our nation. We pray that people would see uh, the danger of wicked ideology mm -hmm. and that people would see that Christ is the only place where they can find forgiveness and truth in this world. So we pray that the truth would set our nation free yes, and that we would escape the grip of these dangerous ideologies. Mm -hmm. In the Lord's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.